please visit sleepapia.org to get more videos like this one, as well as audio and blog content. Join us at sleepapnea.org to be included in the conversation and updated whenever new programs are available. Thanks for joining us, and enjoy! Hello everybody! Welcome to another sleepapnea.org sleep series. My name is Kevin Bradley, and today I'm delighted to have Dr. Partha Sarathi with me, and he's the MD Director um, for the Center for Sleep and Circadian Sciences out of the University of Arizona. So how are you, Dr. Sai? Hi, um, I'm doing well. How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm very good, and thank you for joining us today. So today we're going to talk about the um, benefits of our um, peer support program, and this is something that you actually pioneered yourself um, out of Arizona. Can you tell me a little bit how you got the project started off the ground? Yeah, um, actually the idea came from a patient of mine. Um, and um, I distinctly remember the time when I was with a patient in an office. Uh, it was actually a veteran. Um, and um, he had had a very positive, great outcome from the CPAP treatment. Uh, although he initially struggled and he said to me, doc, you know, if there's any patient out there that's struggling with this and not realizing the great improvement in symptoms that I realized, put him in front of me and I'll make sure that I give him advice and, uh, you know, support to make sure that he's adherent with the machine and he realizes the tremendous benefit that I realized. And so that sort of sat in my head and, uh, you know, I come home, I'm actually, my wife is a physician. I was just talking to her, you know, about it. And I said, you know, this patient is such a nice guy. And he came up with this idea. And she said, um, well, I have done something like that where I put two patients together who are trying to control their blood pressure, their diabetes, and their weight. And um, I thought they both would be the same personality phenotypes in these two women started, uh, I connected them and they started talking to each other and started exercising and and uh, were giving each other support and where it was motivational as well as sort of a support program and they ended up doing great. And so she had done that informally. Um, and then that gave me ideas for actually creating a grant um, or writing a grant and, um, and then decided to do a pilot grant um, submission to the VA to formalize the program, do it under research auspices to see if this would really benefit or not. And so that's how the idea originated. So the idea credit, you know, goes to patients. And as a you know clinician, we consider patients as walking textbooks. Each patient teaches us something new. And um, and to my wife, you know, who from whom I get a lot of great ideas. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, sort of, you know, this is a great idea. And, and um, we do see these with other, um, you know, syndromes that people have and stuff. But, you know, what, what sort of results do you typically see for patients that are re receiving peer support? Um, what, what type of, uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? So what sort of results do you see from the patients that actually receive peer support? Is it more talking about adherence or is it just getting used to the machine initially? Yeah. Yeah, um, in, in our study, uh, the first uh, pilot study that we did, we found that um, uh, first we wanted to see how feasible this was, you know, so we sort of had a feasibility outcome uh, to see if it's possible uh, that we could do it because at that time we didn't know whether people would actually take to it and what is the acceptance rate, so our acceptability uh, and feasibility were the main, you know, goals, but we also said, okay, let's look at what is the effect on CPAP adherence, which is one of our, you know, endpoints or goals. And uh, we found that 90% um, of the people that were approached about the program found it to be acceptable and were willing to participate. And it was obviously feasible. And then we found that there was a improvement in CPAP usage over a three month period. I and mean, when we looked at the adherence on a weekly basis over that uh, 12 week program. And so we saw a small improvement in the CPAP adherence. And more importantly, we found that there was a signal uh, in terms of their patient satisfaction, uh, global satisfaction with the care that was delivered, because now they have someone that they can relate to, they're sharing advice with them, and they're um, um, 
uh, acceptability, the feasibility, uh, the satisfaction, and the CPAP adherence, we saw these signals, but we needed to do a larger study uh, to actually adequately answer the question uh, and show strong statistical differences. So this pilot study gave us the, uh, the initial findings uh, that prompted us to do a more well-powered, more definitive study. Uh, but those were the early findings uh, that we found before we did the larger uh, PCORI funded study um, where we found that um, there was uh, improvement in significant improvement in adherence uh, over 52 minutes of nightly usage. And what is more is we found that some of them crossed the threshold of the four hour uh, a night for five nights a week threshold that um, that would prevent them from losing the CPAP medical benefits. So uh, when we look at that, um, that is a very tangible endpoint rather than a few extra minutes of usage per night if they cross the threshold where they could actually lose the CPAP benefits, that's a pretty tangible endpoint. And what we found was that uh, for every nine people we treated, one person um, crossed the threshold. Uh, for every nine people that we used the intervention, one person stands to not lose their CPAP benefits, uh, what we call a number needed to treat, uh, which was uh, one is to nine. Wow. So that in itself is so beneficial for someone just, you know, the fact that there, there's a potential there to lose their benefits if they're not um, crossing that threshold. So that's a wonderful outcome. Well done. So, you know, before COVID, ASAA had in-person awake groups for peer support. Uh, the support awake peer mentors provides is all done virtually over the phone now. Can you just describe how that looks? Yeah. Yeah. Um the patient can actually call um, and or register through a website for you know the ASAA, the American Sleep Apnea Association, and they get enrolled into this program and then they go through a training. Um, what we did in the previous study is being reduplicated here. Uh, we did um, two sessions of training. The second session is needed only if someone is not up to uh, snuff or up to par. And there's a series of uh, videos as well as there is a handbook uh, essentially a peer body training manual, uh, which is available as a PDF. But all of the contents of the PDF or the peer body training manual and the principles um, are embedded also in the videos. Uh, so if we break down the way the pro program was operationalized, um, there were two uh, sort of in-person visits where they can show how the machine operates and how the machine can be taken apart, put together and things of that nature. And then there were follow-up of, uh, you know, eight um, you know, phone calls uh, that happened, uh, a bulk of which happened in the first um, three months. And then there are optional phone visits in the subsequent uh, months. And each phone call, uh, you know, there would be um, tips for them as to what are the areas or problematic areas of a ZPAP user that they can actually touch upon and what are the solutions they can offer for those particular areas. So it's um, motivational, uh, it is um, educational, uh, it is sort of behavioral support. So there are various elements of um, that are embedded in there. If I was able to use this and I became adherent with it. So if I can do it, you can do it, you know, so that it's sort of that motivational experience based uh, advice or to say something like, you know, in the past, I could not finish a movie when I'm watching it with my spouse, and I would fall asleep much to my spouse's disappointment and chagrin. And uh, but now I'm able to actually finish the entire movie, or I can actually, you know, take care of my grandkids um, while my adult, uh, you know, uh, sons or daughters can actually, you know, you know, go out, and I can actually enjoy my grandchildren. So I had a lot of these experiences, these patients share, which are essentially motivational. Or it could be pure educational support, saying that, hey, this is connected to a high blood pressure. This is connected to heart disease. My diabetes control became better, or my blood pressure control became better. So, so that would be sort of, um, you know, educational uh, to s talk about health literacy, about the connection of sleep apnea with sleepy driving, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and all of that. Um, and then some of that could be pure a navigational advice saying that, you know, the first 30 days, did you know you can return your mask and get another mask for free? You can swap out the mask. 
if you have difficulty and if you miss the magical first 30 days, then uh, uh, then you actually are going to have to suffer a copay because now it's an additional, uh, you know, um, 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 uh, service that the home care company is rendering for you. Make sure you keep the home care, uh, you know, company's phone number handy. Make sure you're an activated patient. By activated patient, I mean um, write a calendar for your health calendar, you know, and jot down your appointments, not just for your sleep doctor's appointment, but for other appointments as well. So what we found that there was these spin-offs uh, where they could actually talk to them uh, to activate the patient, motivate the patient, and educate the patient. So sort of a trifecta, which tackles three of the barriers uh, for CPAP adherence. And so that's how the program is designed over those eight phone calls. They go rotationally through various key elements and then they repeat it for a good measure. So they lay it on thick, as they say it, so that what ends up happening is, is that uh, the patient gets that kind of education or a period of time. Wow, that's really beneficial for sure. And, you know, as you, you were speaking about this, it sort of resonated with me in the past, one of our uh, Facebook um, events. Well, as you know, most people, they, they go, they get their sleep app their machine and they're given this box with a you know bit of instructions and then they're like now what do i do <laughs> you know so you know it's very involved and i feel that you know a lot of people out there underestimate the experiences they have um navigating through their own um usage so it's just you know matching people up to help benefit someone else with some of the issues that they themselves had dealt with i did see that you know, we're trying to match people with age, gender, time zone, and such like. Um, is there a need or push to, you know, also look at how someone, what someone's diagnosis is, for example? Um, or is it someone that, um, if they're having issues with a full mask, uh, try and match them up with someone else who uses a full mask? Is that pulled into play, or are we just looking for more people to be in the pool so that we can actually navigate through that as well? Yeah, um, when we match folks, so the, the couple of key features that we match them for were sort of the age bracket and, and uh, of course, gender. Um, so uh, those were the key things that we did matching, but we also did matching based on in the in in the in person you know study, I mean, we actually did it um, uh, in terms of sort of personality types, in terms of where someone's coming from. You know, is this a high school teacher as opposed to someone who you know uh, you know uh, is um, working in a factory line or something like that? So we sort of looked at that, or actually my staff did, and did a little bit of that kind of matching, but they were limited with that because. You know, we had about 50 odd uh, mentors um, and there's only so many people that are available at any given point in time. And so we have to already match for the age bracket where we match them within the 10 years of decile plus or minus. But there were times when we had a 70 year old patient, uh, I mean, a 70 year old mentor and a, uh, you know, 40 year old active duty military person. <laughs> yeah. Well. Um, so there were the, since there was an age, I never had a gender gap, but it was difficult for us to match for other facets or other factors um, because uh, what ends up uh, happening uh, is, is that we um, uh, it gets a little complicated. We don't have enough number of mentors for us to match people by the mass type and such. And so what we did was we actually educated um, these mentors on various kind of masks that are available. They, they themselves became more knowledgeable. An interesting outcome of the study was that when we did the pilot study, um, some of our uh, reviewers asked us, hey, what about the mentors? Did you study the mentors? Was there any benefits to them on that? And then when we actually, when we did the study, um, the second study, the larger study, we decided to make the mentors as research participants as well. And they've signed an you know, informed consent. So we can actually do measurements there. And we found that mentors did, who actually provided the support, their health-related quality of life improved. The adherence was already high, did not change statistically, because only if you're an adherent mentor do you qualify to be in the program. 
uh, but we found that the mentors um, felt more satisfied. And anecdotally, when we were talking to these mentors, they would say, you know, I'm retired. I participated in this program. I just enjoyed talking to these people. I enjoyed helping them. And I felt really good about it because they feel valued. Uh, they feel respected. They feel like they're contributing to, um, you know, healthcare and the wellness of people in a positive way. And so it's actually a very feel good feeling that they are having and that reflected in their outcomes questionnaires. Yeah. Good. You know, and the satisfaction of the whole program from, from a mentor's perspective is huge as well. Um, because you want to retain these people to, you know, keep, keep giving their peers support. So that that's wonderful news to hear. When you do speak to the mentors, what are some of the common questions or hurdles that mentors offer guidance on? Um, well, the mask, as you pointed out, is a major issue. You know, people have a lot of problems with masks, but the second issue is sometimes what hides as a mask issue is actually a, a nose congestion issue. Um, we have done a prior research, uh, which we published back in 2007, where we showed that nasal congestion or obstruction, which is a common symptom that coexists with uh, obstructive sleep apnea, is a common reason uh, why people have difficulty using the CPAP. These are people who don't have claustrophobia, but when they put the mask on, they're like, oh, I feel claustrophobic. Well, do you feel claustrophobic when you're in a ele small elevator? No. Do you feel claustrophobic when you're in a very small room? No. Have you ever felt claustrophobic before besides using CPAP? No. But when I put the mask on, I feel claustrophobic. Those people have nasal congestion and obstruction. So when that is identified, the mentors are being trained, and there's also an option in the phone tree where they call this 1-800 or, you know, number for the American Sleep Apnea Association, uh, that they can actually, you know, choose an option where it, when they explain those kinds of symptoms, they're asked to talk to their care provider uh, for them to get a medication or a prescription medication for nasal congestion, not over-the-counter medications like Afrin and things like that, which is bad for their blood pressure, mm -hmm. uh, but actually prescription medications that can actually get to the bottom of it. So that's a key problem. So one is mask, two is uh, being able to, um, um, you know, breathe through their nose, therefore they can actually use a CPAP um, better. And that applies not just to, uh, you know, a nasal mask or nasal pillow, but it also applies to people with full face mask. Even though someone has a full face mask, they still need to be able to breathe through their nose to actually have an effective treatment. So I can't uh, overemphasize the importance of that as a common complaint and a common barrier. Um, um, but then the other factors are understanding, you know, some people have gadget fear. I mean, they look at the machine, there are all these buttons and lights and they're like freaked out about it. So we need someone that can actually break it down into smaller pieces. You know, in the, originally when we did the pilot study, it was like in the VA, what we used to tell our, you know, uh, veterans because they've been in active duty military, as, as you know, for example, the Marines need to be able to disassemble, uh, you know, uh, you know a, a weapon and put it back together blindfolded. And so, well, what we try to encourage them is, is to say that, hey, you need to be able to use uh, the CPAP. You, you need to be able to just, uh, you know, know how to disassemble and put it back together. And so th those are the things that we do in the initial visits in the first seven to 10 days uh, where we actually have them meet with the mentors or in the virtual these videos uh, that are machine specific, uh, where they can actually break it down into small, you know, pieces know when is what, know which button is what, they need someone to show that to them. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And so we actually, before we started the program, we went and observed some of the CPAP education classes, uh, you know, that happened and was striking what the, uh, that particular smart respiratory therapist would do is put the machine and the masks um, of each patient on our table. There'll be five of them meeting that was like a group uh, session. And they would put it all on a big table and they would have their chairs drawn up to it. And she will wait for a little while before she starts because she's apparently waiting for others to join. But she wants to see how people interact with the machine and the mask, you know, before things start. And I actually was observing this and I noticed, for example, one patient, uh, you know, many patients are not touching it because they're scared to touch it because they don't want to make a fool of themselves in front of others. But then there are the brave ones that go touch it and try to put it on and try to play with the buttons. And I actually distinctly vividly remember, you know, this is literally, you know, over 10 years ago, one patient put a nasal mask upside down 
on his face with the broad end of it actually on the bridge of the nose and the narrow end underneath his nostril. So uh, especially during COVID times when people are drop shipping these masks and machines, you know, that comes and arrives in a box and they expect it to know all of this, overcome their gadget fears. Some people may be able to do it, but many people may not be able to do it. The, and the whole intent of the program, especially during the COVID pandemic, is to be able to do that education. There are some elderly people, middle-aged people who are sheltering in place, don't want to go to the doctor's office. A lot of the visits are happening through televisits because they don't want to go out there and catch the coronavirus. And then there is some confusion as to whether using a CPAP can actually spread the disease in a household and things of that nature. And this, that's why this program is there explicitly to address that knowledge gap during the COVID pandemic when people are sheltering in place. I myself have used these videos for my patients to say, hey, go to this website, you'll have these videos, play those videos and you will understand you know, um, various aspects to the program where we have done a reenactment of all of these visits. Uh, the same videos that are used for dementors can also be seen by patients. Um, but also we have a series of videos about the CPAP machines, how to clean a CPAP machine, how to, you know, how often do you clean a CPAP machine? What do you clean a CPAP machine with? The mask versus the humidifier and, and things of that nature. Um, they're all uh, embedded in there so that they can use that for them to be able to better manage it and also feel confident. You know, you know, you just talk about self-efficacy. In other words, you know, how confident are you that you can manage your sleep apnea and use the machine and derive benefit from it? We want to raise that confidence level in these people because once you raise the confidence level, they're more likely to use it. And so during the COVID times, it's become even more important to disseminate this far and wide and dispel uh, these false notions that using a CPAP is going to spread the infection. The bottom line is if they're using it at home, by virtue of even if they're COVID positive, um, their family members are already at threefold, three times, 300% more likelihood of developing coronavirus than uh, people who are not in their household. So mm -hmm. they're already kind of exposed and toast. So for this person to not use a CPAP for fear of spreading the infection, the odds are that they are harming themselves, especially if they're COVID negative by acutely withdrawing and not using the CPAP that they're supposed to. And they are gaining weight during COVID times by lack of exercise. The blood pressures are getting more bone out of control but for lack of exercise. And not using the CPAP is the last thing that they need to uh, you know, cause further detriment to their health. And that's why the program is there is to say, even though these are coronavirus times, your household members have already been exposed. That's why you're sheltering in place. Even if you're you know, near and dear ones, had been exposed, you all stay together and you don't contaminate or spread the infection to others. So stay that way, but continue to use the CPAP because if anything, your respiratory system, your lungs need the help of the CPAP, and, you know, even if you have the coronavirus. So, uh, so that's sort of the ideology to uh, allow better dissemination of uh, information and education when people are sheltering in place, not able to go in and see their providers. Uh, yeah. All these false notions that uh, device interact with each other. Sure, you know, and, and you just, you know, you raise a good point there during these, you know, unprecedented times where we're seeing people isolated. You know, I can't impress upon people as much as like having someone there that they can call at the end of the phone to offer support, you know, when when they're, they're isolated and they don't really have anybody around them or know what to do is so valuable. And, you know, I'll remind people towards the end of this, but, you know, you can enroll, please visit us at sleepapnea.org and look for the peer mentors. It's up in the navigation bar at the top and you can enroll there. But Dr. Sai, I just wanted to ask for people out there that are curious or interested in enrolling, and um, you know, we hope that there are many. Um, what is the process to become an, a, an awake peer mentor? Um, they enroll um, in the website, as you mentioned, and also call a phone number uh, of the American Sleep Happening Association who will guide them through that. And they have to take this training. Uh, and once they've taken the training, um, then they are, you know, a peer mentor.
um, you know, they go through a sort of an, um, sort of a phone screening interview process so that they understand what are the do's and don'ts of the program, uh, because they're not providing care, they're sharing their experiences. Uh, and so there are certain, and if there's any medical issue that, uh, they're, uh, um, the individual that they're assigned to brings up, they should ask them to talk about that with their health professionals. So this is meant to be a support and educational program. This is not supposed to, you know, be delivering any sort of medical advice and things of that nature. So they are, they go through that training process and we make sure that they've understood the training before we release them to others um, as part of the program. Sure. And obviously we're looking for people who are comfortable with their use, you know, providing at least four hours with themselves per night, um, that they're um, yes. comfortable with their machine and their therapy. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that's a very key point. Um, uh, thanks for mentioning that, uh, is that they themselves need to be um, adherent with the machine so that then um, they are an advantage point of yeah. explaining to others, um, you know, or what are the right things to do to be adherent? Yes. Sure. I mean, I, I, there are great points for people out there. And again, this whole idea is to, you know, encourage peer support. We see it in many different um, backgrounds. Uh, my background is more in the kidney transplant world. And we certainly have the Kidney Foundation match people up who are considering a transplant, for example, or have a living donor, or, you know, just, just need to hook up with someone and discuss it. And the benefits, like you've said, Dr. Sy, are just, you know, amazing for people, especially, again, more important during these times where people may feel a little bit isolated. Um, anything else we should add before we, we leave this series? Yeah, I think one of the key aspects is train the trainer. You know, once these mentors get uh, trained by the uh, American Sleep Apnea Association, then they start training other people. And, um, you know, one of the, you know, great things in the reach uh, of the uh, American Sleep Apnea Association is, as you know, um, a, there are a lot of people as part of the AWAKE programs who are volunteers. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that I, you know, failed to mention is that, uh, you know, this AWAKE program has been always in existence going way back in the past. And I can't remember when it was started, probably in the early 1990s. Um, and at that time, when that program was running, if people would gather in you know places of worship or in the local public library and these were great citizens um who decided that they're just going to grab some coffee and cookies and uh you know put up a stall in the local you know church or uh, you know public library and spread the information saying hey come on over we're going to all share with each other tips and tricks about how to do a better job of it using CPAP and yada, yada, yada. So this kind of sort of a program has been in existence way back in the past. And these were patients or motivated sleep technicians, uh, motivated sleep health educators who are actually doing this program. What we're doing now in the virtual world is getting into the virtual place, uh, getting it digitized, uh, disseminating to the very same good people. But at the end of the day, we need these good people who are able to see this as a sort of a mission. If they benefited from it, they wanna spread the message. Essentially they become all local champions and by not only mentoring, you know, and patients, but also become mentors so that, you know, it's like a train and a train that actually allows us to rapidly disseminate across the country. So it's an ambitious countrywide program um, because of that sort of effect of uh, train the trainer. So just wanted to share that each of the mentors is going to train other, not only three patients, but also going to train three other mentors. And, and, and those mentors, again, are going to take care of three patients each. So you can just imagine after we see that with the you know, first couple of thousand peer mentors, they not only take care of three patients, but then they mentor three mentors and so are trained three mentors and then each one of those mentors train three patients each so mm -hmm. you can see the geometric progression of the number of people that get educated about the program and uh, you know the american sleep apnea association has a history of having run these educational uh, programs and having following and so if they are offering the solution it'll allow more people to become members of the american sleep apnea association and perhaps end up with something 
you know, greater than what we envisioned. So I know it's an ambitious program, but I'm, I'm hoping that it, it has a runaway phenomenon <laughs> where it more. becomes widely available. Yeah, and you know, as people become more comfortable with their usage and, you know, they, they cross that hurdle of maybe a year and they're, they're doing great, then I'm sure that's uh, your, your grounds for recruiting them to become mentors as well and, and champion exactly. the program. Exactly. I'm mean, glad that you mentioned that because when we did, you know, our research study, we've done three of these, so, you know, one with the VA originally as a pilot study and then with the PCORI and now, uh, you know, funded real study and, you know, randomized uh, control trial. And now as part of the dissemination implementation effort, uh, when we train someone uh, and then they become adherent users, um, uh, these patients come back to us and say, hey, I want to be a mentor now because I want to pass the light on um, that was passed on to me and I want to be part of the program. So we had many patients come and join us after they've been successful graduates as patients, but now wanting to serve as a mentor because their uh, adherence is over the four hour threshold. And it's just not for people getting the CPAP machine for the first time. Uh, it's also for people who had a CPAP machine and are struggling to use, use it, trying to make the cut. So it's for them as well. Yeah. You know, and this all obviously highlights how important sharing our experiences are and, and you know, to let people know out there that no one's alone and shouldn't have to overcome some of these hurdles alone. So, yeah, this is a great way to give back and help someone get the quality sleep they deserve. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sai. And again, like I said, please visit us at sleepapnea.org and you can enroll in the Awake Peer Mentor Program. Just look for it at the top of the navigation bar, and we hope to be hearing from you all sometime soon. Dr. Sai, thank you so much again, and good thank luck. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us today. Be an awake angel, and you can help those financially impacted by COVID-19. Just fifty dollars can provide two CPAP masks to someone in need. Please visit sleepapnea.org slash donate for details. BASAA is a patient-focused organization. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube page, join us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram or sleepapnea.org and you can join the conversation. It's all free.